Who are you? I'm Ian Mikhail Fugazi from Washington, D.C. Ian, you're in here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, Burnaby. Canada, DOA, minor threat. You have a poster in your hand. What do you remember about that? This show actually is uh, fairly legendary in, in Washington, D.C. terms. DOA first came to Washington, D.C. in October of 1979. They played a, a commune called Madam's Oregon. And uh, we, um, actually, I was sick that night. It's one of the two or three shows I actually intensely regret not going to. But everyone came back and said, this band from Canada is incredible. They, and this is 1979 when nobody was touring, and they showed up and played in a really, like a hovel, basically. It was a commune, it was so, like, the PA was made out of, like, oatmeal canisters and stuff. And so, the fact that they had come, everyone was saying, deal away. And the tape, there's a live tape from that show that was just spread around, that everyone just traded and traded and traded. Um, in 1981, was it 81? Was it 80? Well, I guess it was 81, yeah. Um, 81, uh, we got word that they were, they wanted to come down from New York, they're doing a show in New York and they wanted to come down. And we had no real access to any venues whatsoever. But there was this high school, H.P. Woodlawn, there was an alternative kind of high school and they let us do one gig before. So we had another gig sort of set up there so we called DOA and said like, well if you guys want to come down, we can't pay you. If you want to come down and play this high school, we'll let you play on the show we have. It was just like a, it was like a, it was a free gig basically. And they just showed up. They played an incredible set. We just passed a hat. We raised like, you know, 75 bucks. They were totally happy um, to get this dough. But most importantly, like that, that, the fact that it had shown up meant so much to us that it was like, it actually is one of the, the main reasons that as like a band like Fugazi or anything I've ever been involved with, there's always, we've always had this kind of like philosophy of like, you always must make the gig. Like if DOA can make it to a high school, just to pass a hat in 1981, we damn sure have to make it to every gig we ever commit to. It's like, that's the, like the most important thing. That was really inspirational. DOA, you know, they were, they were like, I think a lot of times people forget what an important band they were. And the fact they toured as much as they did early on, they were really like the Mavericks, or like one of the, them and Black Flag, and they were the bands that really went out and like blazed the trail. You also enjoyed the Subhumans, right? Didn't you guys yeah. play with them? Yeah, yeah, Subhumans, I, actually Myron Third didn't play with Subhumans, that was Black, f um, the Bad Brains and SOA played with Subhumans. Subhumans stayed at my parents' house, so did DOA for that matter. You know, we all, everyone came and stayed at my parents' house and um, yeah, I remember the Subhuman guys too, they were great guys and that was a really cool show. That show was shut down, um, it was at a place called the Rumba Club, it was on the corner of like, an alley and uh, SOA and Bad Brains are great, both, both men are so great and Subhumans came on um, and Actually, I guess they played before this um, Bad Brains, but when they were playing, this guy who was like a Krishna guy lived in an apartment building behind there, was trying to meditate, and there was so much noise coming up that he called the police, and the police raided the show during the Subhuman set, and there was a long sort of discussion about whether the show would go on. It did go on, but so, yeah, Subhuman was a really cool band as well. When DOA did Hardcore 81, was that the first time you heard the word hardcore? I don't know, actually. We've thought about, I've thought about that a lot. I remember from our point of view, the reason that we started using the term hardcore is that we were really trying to um, differentiate between what people were calling punk rock, which is like this very Sid Vicious kind of, kind of New York or London kind of posy kind of uh, st fashion, like a fashion thing. Like it was like, that was punk rock, like you're supposed to, you know, spit on yourself and this, all this kind of stuff. And we thought, well, we're not, that's like a fashion thing. We're hardcore punk rock kids like we like so you know hard shell baptist have you ever heard that term hard shell baptist well hard shell baptist is a person whose relationship with god is so intense they actually don't need to follow any of the like they can drink and smoke and whore around doing anything they want because that's how hard shell they are so the hardcore punk doesn't really need to like do any of the stuff that people sort of attribute to punk rockers other than just like be dedicated to what they're doing. So that's where we first started using that term. I don't know if DOA is the first person band to use that, but it was right at the same time. It all happened at the same time. Ian, how about other Canadian bands? Like, I know the rock and roll band Sloan, and they told me they made a pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. in about 1988 and almost stayed at your house. Do you remember some guys from Halifax coming to your house? Yeah, sure. There's also a band called Jellyfish from Hal in Halifax. I think we're involved with this. Jellyfish band. Babies. Jellyfish Babies, right. Yeah, they actually, they were, those guys were cool. They would drive all the way down for like these, we did the shows in these, this free show in the park. Um, and they would come down and we've run into them from time to time. 
Um, I don't know many Eastern ca Canadian bands like like Halifax bands. I, mean, I only know a handful. Obviously, when we tour, we play with bands. You know, we've met people like that. I remember a band called Porcelain Head? Do you remember them? They were from Porcelain Forehead. Porcelain Forehead. Yeah, you are the man. Um, I, I always liked them. They were kind of cool. There's been over the years, been you know, there's been bands. I'm like, ah, okay, of course, in the vile tones, of course. Which were, Did you see them? Never saw them, but that single was one of our like. You know, that was like part of the constellation. One of their t-shirts is for sale in LA for $250 US. No, if people will buy it, then that's what they'll sell it for, I guess. So Ian, are you a vegan? Why do you ask? Just curious what you've been eating on tour and how Canada's been doing. I understand you went had some good food there in Winnipeg. Where did you hear that from? Oh, just heard it from a little bird. <laughs> did you eat some good food in Winnipeg, Ian? I did eat good food. I've actually, Canada's been very good for food. But I don't generally don't think that interesting to talk about my diet, so. Well, just curious, what is some of you eat two of? What do I eat two of? Like right now, if I saw some cheese, I'd have two slices of cheese. Is there something you like to have two of, Ian? Uh, two bananas could never hurt anybody. I was curious, Ian, when you're living there in DC, people coming to your house, did you one time have a stalker living on your lawn? Like in about 85? Did I have a stalker? We had, uh, there was a woman who once came and lived on a porch, but it's not actually a very humorous story. She ended up killing herself, so. How about the rest of the members of Fugazi? Doesn't Joe live in some sort of satanic house or some house that was deemed satanic, Ian? Now, according to the Prince George's County Police, yeah, Joe lived in a house that was a bunch of young kids living together. It was outside of a university. And, you know, they were into, you know, they listened to Joy Division and stuff like that, but they weren't Satanists by any means. But what had happened was that uh, one, of the, one of the people who lived in the house had found and the university is a biology section. They found a bunch of dead cats in the dumpster. And they thought, oh, this would be cool. We'll get some cat skulls. So they had these dead cats hanging to, in the sun to try to get the, you know, to get the hide off, basically, trying to get back to the bones. And somebody called the police when they raided the house. It was like in the paper, they were satanic, a satanic cult and all this stuff. Um, I don't think they were. I think that's just a, a typical kind of misunderstanding. Ian, your dad was in the Kennedy motorcade. I find this fascinating. Please explain if you could. Where did you hear that? In Punk Planet, collected interviews. Oh, yes. Uh, my father was uh, on the White, White House press corps in 1960, uh, 60, 61. He was working for the uh, Houston Chronicle? No, Minneapolis Star at that time, I guess. And uh, he was just in the press corps and he was in the motorcade. He was just in a bus with a bunch of the other journalists following you know, the limousine as they came into Dallas. But he was not, like, you know, they were like two blocks back. So they had no idea what had happened. It was just suddenly, the bus they were riding in just suddenly accelerating and just whipped right through Dealey Plaza where the shooting occurred. Um, and they saw everybody running. They knew something bad had happened, but no one had any idea. They didn't know what had happened at all until they got to Parkland Hospital. They just pulled up in front of the hospital and that's when it became apparent that something very bad it happened at that point. Has your dad seen JFK or does he have any conspiracy theories about it? Like, you know, the driver killing Kennedy? No, my father actually is really, he doesn't think anybody did it but Oswald. He has no conspiracy theories whatsoever about that. He has more conspiracy. My father actually feels like the real, the real mystery is not the JFK shooting, it's the Martin Luther King. He thinks that's, that is nonsense. That was a setup. He didn't think James Earl Ray did that alone. He thinks that was definitely a conspiracy. He's a pretty smart guy, too, editing the crossword puzzle. That's not too easy, is it, for the Washington Post? I think it's a, sort of a habit thing. If you are in the habit of doing crossword puzzles, it's not that hard to edit them. He's been doing it for quite a while. My father, both my parents are, are certainly not, um, they're both very intelligent people. When Fear played on Saturday Night Live, Ian, did you go down to Saturday Night Live and check it out in New York with Rollins and the gang? So Rollins was not there. Uh, I'll tell you the story about that if you like to hear the story about that. In 8 in the morning, uh, some point in October, I got a call. Um, I was driving a newspaper truck for the Washington Post at the time, so 8 in the morning was brutal. Uh, it was Lauren Michaels' office calling, Lauren Michaels being the producer of Saturday Night Live. And I get this, this woman who said, Lauren Michaels' office, please hold. Now, I was completely delirious. Um, Lauren Michaels comes in the phone, he goes, Hi, Ian, this is Lauren Michaels of Saturday Night Live. I'm calling you because um, I got your number from John Belushi. Uh, he says that uh, you might be able to help us get some dancers up here because we want to have fear on the show. I was completely baffled by this. And I, couldn't, I was like, pardon me? And he goes, hold on a second. And then John Belushi gets on the phone and he's like, and he says, hey, this is John Belushi. Um, 
I'm a big fan of Fears. I made a deal with Shine Out Live that I would make a cameo appearance on the show if they would let Fear play. Um, I got your number from Penelope Spears, who did the Decline Western Civilization, and she said that you guys, the Washington DC punk rock kids, know how to dance. And so I wanted to get you guys to come up to the show. And uh, you know, you guys can all come up. So it worked out that we could all arrive at the uh, Rockefeller Center where the, where the Center Live is being filmed. Um, the password to get in was Ian Mackay. And um, we went up the day before. The Misfits played with the Necros um, at the Ukrainian Hall, I think. So all the Detroit people were there, like Tesco, V, and Corey Rusk, and all those people from the Necros and Touch and Go people. And uh, a bunch of DC people, maybe 15 or 20 of us came up from DC. Henry was gone. He was living in LA at this point. So um, we went to the show. Uh, during the dress rehearsal, things got the camera got knocked over. We were dancing. They were very angry with us, and they said they were gonna lock up. You know, they were gonna not let us do it, and whatever. And then Belushi really put his foot down, and insisted on it. So then, during the actual set itself, they let us come out again. But if you watch the show, have you seen it? Yes, I have. Well, if you watch it, you know there's a during the show before they go to commercials, they always go to this jack o' lantern, this carved pumpkin. Um, well, right before if you watch it during the song. You'll see one of our guys, this guy Bill McKenzie, coming out holding the pumpkin above his head because he's just he's just getting ready to smash it. And that's when they cut, they just cut it off. They cut us off. They kicked us out. They locked us up for like two hours. We were locked in a room after that. They were so angry with us about um, the behavior. I, I didn't think it was all that big of a they deal. They locked you in a room? Yeah, we were locked in a room. They said they were going to sue us and have us arrested for damages. There wasn't, there was such an infl um, so much hype about that. The New York Post reported like. Five, half a million dollars worth of damage on stuff, but it, it was nothing. It was like a little plastic clip or something got broken. It was um, it was a very interesting experience, and um, I realized how completely unnatural it is for a band to suddenly to be on a television show, particularly a band like a punk band that kind of has a momentum to suddenly be expected to like immediately just jump in to like a song. In that kind of setting, it was very weird. It was it yeah, largely unpleasant? Made me realize that yeah, that's something I'm not interested in doing. Was Rollins the hardest dancer? I know he wasn't there. Was he the hardest dancer in DC? I don't think there's a any kind of meter for that sort of thing. I couldn't tell you. Or one of the wilder ones? Because you mentioned one of those guys that was at Saturday Night Live. Who were some of the ones that stick out in your mind? Some of the more more adventuresome dancers there, Ian. We were all we all had our own styles. I mean, the thing about DC kids is that. We actually danced. I think a lot of people really, there was this whole thing that kind of came up later on, which was called whatever it was called. But we never did like the slam dancing thing was always kind of a media invention. We actually had like some of a choreography in our dancing, we felt like. Um, we were also tough though. I mean, there was a lot of, it was an era where there was a lot of fighting going on. That was part of that era. You know, like, I think when punk was new, it caused a lot of friction. And I think that a lot of the kids who were involved with it, uh, fell prey to a lot of the more aggressive elements of society. So kids fought back and then it became that language became a little bit too deeply ingrained in the community and then the violence itself became a problem and that needed to be eradicated, you know. Have you been in the slam pit at all? In my life? Yeah, recently. I no. I thought in Brazil you jumped in a giant circle pit. Ah, that was 1994. Was that, is that recent? Well, kind of recent. That actually was a show we played in um, Belo Horizonte. It was like this giant free festival. It was the first independent festival they'd ever done. It was in a parking lot of a train station. There was about 4,000 people there. The stage was about 26 feet high. It was a totally absurd situation. But between the bands, um, over the PA they would play um, like, uh, what's, what's that? Sepultura? Sepultura, exactly. Bands like Sepultura, they love like grindcore metal kind of stuff. And when they would play these bands, this insane, like five or 600 like peopled circle would develop. And Guy and I were just watching, like we were incredulous. It just seems impossible that this many people were dancing. And it was, a, it was as big as this field. Here, show them the field so you get a sense of the, I mean, it was a huge, huge, um, circle, pit. circle pit thing. And so Guy said, I'll give you a buck if you go for that. So I just got out, it was, I just did the whole like one circular, it was incredible actually. I mean, I, it was, I was laughing so hard and it was, I mean, it was totally enjoyable. Those kids were not slamming per se. There was no like punches being thrown. It was just, just dancing in a giant circle. 
At Hagen Doss working there with Henry Rollins, did you guys once put out rat poison as a topping? That is true. But we didn't obviously didn't serve it. We just thought it was funny because it was pink and colorful. And nobody ever asked for it, so I don't think we would have put out too long, but I think that the idea was that it just looked so humorous among like the, the jimmies, the sprinkles, the coconut, you know, the raisins, and then you have this little pink confection. Did you and Henry also give a rat a mohawk? Henry, that was his mo his rat, Spike. You gave it a mohawk, or he gave he it a did. mohawk? I didn't. I was. He was actually not a mohawk, it was a stripe. It wasn't a, sh a haircut, it was a hair dye. He put a black stripe down his back. And what's this about it being in the freezer and then melting on Jello by Afro, Ian? Well, when the rat died, the rat was gotten from, uh, Henry worked at NIH, which was uh, National Institute of Health. And his job at the time when he was a teenager was he had to deal with um, basically gassing rats who were experiment rats. So they would just do these experiments with like 400 rats and then he would take the rats and put them into like a garbage bag and then gas them and kill them all. So he decided to liberate one of the rats, which was Spike. Um, but whatever tests they were doing on this rat ended up in developing some very bizarre tumor and then the rat died. And Henry, instead of just getting rid of the rat or burying the rat or whatever, he actually made a little milk carton coffin for it and put it into the freezer. The part about melting on Biafra, I don't know. You have to ask Biafra about that. Jello Biafra, I was searching the internet. I'm sure you love questions that are preambled by that. And I found some website that had some story about how Henry Rollins melted a rat on you. Again, this is what happens when you exaggerate stuff on the net. I was crashing in his apartment one night when I went back down to D.C. with DOA after a dead Kennedy's East Coast tour in 81, and uh, he was still Henry Garfield then, and... When I, when I finally fell asleep as the sun was coming up, a roommate took Henry's uh, late pet rat, who was in a little milk carton coffin in the freezer that was still being mourned, and held the rat over me, and the water started to melt. So this rat was kind of dripping and drooling on me when I woke up. Now, when Henry Rollins quit Black Flag, did his hair end up on the wall of the Discord office? No. But you're getting different stories mixed up. Please correct me, Ian. On the wall in the office was Henry. It was a mirror that Henry had smashed with his head, and we had pieces of his mirror with blood all over it. And it was on a piece of cardboard that said, "Mirror that Henry schlonged his head on, plus blood." There was a bag of hair that belonged to me from, uh, at one point, but I got rid of it because it sort of was disgusting after a while. Has Henry ever offered to Ian to get you into like showbiz or get you any acting parts or anything like that? No. Because I've seen Minor Threat popped up for a tiny bit there. What do you think about that in SLC Punk? You know that movie SLC yeah. Punk? There's a bit of Minor Threat in that movie. Yeah. Henry had nothing to do with that though. How about yourself though? Have you ever listened to the Jim Rome sports show? No. I was... know what it is. They, you, they play our music. Yeah, I thought that's pretty cool. Jim Rome. Jim Rome. Jim Rome and a sportscaster. A lot of, you know, it's, you know, uh, the Washington Redskins football team, on last year at least, apparently during like the third down, they had a they would play waiting room in the stadium. I didn't hear it myself. I was told that by many people though. Ian, what do you think about that Poison Idea record where it's <laughs> Ian Mackay? I don't think it's what it's called. It's just called Ian Mackay, and the, the cover is a big spread asshole. I think that's what I don't think I think you're getting two different records mixed up again. But uh, what do I think about him? Oh, well, you know, it hurts my feelings. But I don't really care. Had you known those guys at all or done gigs no, with them? No, I don't know them. But you know, their point of view, this is a lot of people who sort of assail my name or image or whatever. Like their point of view is like there's people who consider him a god. So we're just trying to show that he's a human. But my position is is that you don't throw rocks at human beings. So if you're going to be cruel to me, then you're making me into something that's like apparently larger than life. So if they're going to you, they're going to be ugly about my name or ugly about me, then all they're doing is reinforcing the idea that I'm that I'm not a human being, that I am some weird god or something. I'm comfortable with myself as a human being. I don't know why they have to waste their time writing about me. But that's 12 years ago or 11 years ago. Let's get let's get topical here. Well, how about your pockets, Ian? Do you carry $5 bills in your pockets in case you have to kick somebody out and give them their money back? No, I don't. But if I need to uh, give escort someone out of the room and give them their money back, I'm sure I can borrow the money from somebody in the room. 
but I wouldn't carry it in my pocket, no. I have done so in the past, but we don't have that many problems anymore. We don't really have to um, ask people to leave. You'd be surprised though, if you just give one person's money back, how much more enjoyable an evening can be. Because usually it's just one or two people that are causing most of the problems. Have you, ever, have you ever planted anybody in the audience, I mean, just for a joke and pretended to kick them out just for fun? No. Did Allison of Bratmobile inadvertently chuck a tampon at you guys? You'll have to ask Allison about that. Do you remember the story at all or perhaps what I'm alluding to? Oh, yeah. But you'll still have to ask Allison about that. But what's your take on that story, Ian? My take is you'd have to ask Allison about that. How about your take on this story? <laughs> Calvin Johnson glass ashtray. I didn't throw it. What happened there? Because it's kind of dangerous when you open for Fugazi, isn't it? No. Well, for, wasn't it for beat happening that night? They got like Calvin got a glass ashtray in his like forehead or something that like was, that. It was 1991. I mean, I mean, is it open? The danger open for Fugazi now? No, it's not. How about 1991, 1991? We were playing in Los Angeles. It was a different time, and people there were very aggressive. And when they were playing, uh, somebody threw an ashtray. It was not glass, however. It was plastic, but it was hard enough to split his nose open. And, uh, but he didn't miss a beat because he immediately said, and you may actually get that reference, he said, somebody broke my nose, dumped the whole balcony, which is a reference, you know the reference? Oh, I'm so disappointed in you, Narvar. Help me, Ian, help me, <laughs> teach me, Ian. It's a Germs live album where Darby says, somebody just broke my nose, dumped the whole balcony. So in other words, someone hit him in the face and immediately quotes Darby, who of course is, you know, a quintessential L.A. punk rock guy. I think that was one of the, you know, the Beat Happening's first sort of L.A. punk rock experiences. Like, they played smaller shows, but I don't think they'd ever been in front of something like that. I mean, the crowds have been, you know, gone through quite a cycle. Like, you know, if you've been around, like, I've been involved with music for 21 years now, so I've seen, like, this kind of scene kind of go through all sorts of weird uh, conniptions. And that particular era was really, was weird. It was just, when we first started playing, the music we played was so bizarre. I think it's so funny, people talk about like our last old record being so classic, but when we first played Waiting Room, at that time, contextually, like with the music that was being played, people thought, what is this weird reggae crap? They hated that song. So it just goes to show that like, there's always room for growth and change. And if you don't actually take advantage of that, you're, you're just gonna keep beating on the same drum. Ian, how about some craziness though from promoting gigs and doing your own stuff, like a stage collapsing on you in Phoenix and helicopters overhead. Do you remember that? Like, didn't you go through the stage? I think, yeah, I fell through the stage. It was a waterlogged stage. I was jumping up and down and it just went up to my knees and actually managed to cut my shins fairly severely. But meanwhile, there was a police helicopter going around with a spotlight on us and skinhead kids rioting out in the uh, street there. You just can't get away from the airplane circling around Ian Mackay here in Fugazi. Too when you're on a flight path, apparently. When the Teen Idols flew out to LA to do a gig, did you play with the Mentors? We took a Greyhound bus out to LA. We didn't fly. Sorry, I correct myself. I'm so disappointed with you. Uh, we played at the um, Hong Kong Cafe with Vox Pop, who ended up being 45 Grave, The Mentors, and a band called Puke Spittin' Guts. Um, we borrowed Vox Pop's bass amp. We borrowed Paul Cutler's bass. We actually flew, we took this Greyhound bus out there carrying a guitar, a bass, and a pair of drumsticks. We just assumed we'd be able to borrow equipment. We did actually end up borrowing equipment, but they were not pleased about it. And we were paid for that gig. Fifteen dollars? Fifteen dollars, that's absolutely right. And eleven dollars at the gig in San Francisco. That's correct, at the Mabuhay Gardens. So a new wave night. You know who we played with? We played with the Wrong Brothers there. That's new wave. Wrong Brothers instead of the Right Brothers, see? I was curious, how did San Francisco respond to, like, the speed and the aggression of the teen idols? Well, the night we played was a new wave night, so the actual response from the new wave crowd was one of disinterest. Um, Extreme disinterest, I might even say. But the night before, the show we were supposed to play on was with the Dead Kennedys, Flipper, and the Circle Jerks. Um, Dirk Dirksen, who was the uh, guy who ran the joint, the Mugway Gardens, had just dropped us from the bill because he didn't like the po He asked us for a photo. We sent him a fucking photo. Oh, sorry, we sent him a photo. And uh, he just uh, said, oh, the dumb photo. And he just dropped us from the bill without telling us. So we'd taken a bus all the way out there for two shows and we got to the one show and it was gone. So he felt so bad that he put us on the next night, which was like new wave night. But a lot of the kids who we met, primarily HB kids from LA, like the Huntington Beach punk rock kids, 
who came up with the Circle Jerks came out to the gig. And they were they were they seemed to like it. What were the mentors like? Did they help prepare you for working with Tesco V? They, no, they were just kind of um, they were pretty scary guys. They were big with hoods on. Nel Duce, I remember, carried his SVT uh, cabinet by himself, like which is that's a heavy amp or heavy cabinet. Um, they were they're kind of weird. I mean, it was all weird. I mean, we were so overwhelmed by the whole experience that the whole thing was just strange. Tesco, uh, on the other hand, I knew as a person. I didn't know him as a character. Ian, HR of Bad Brains, when they started out, was he a pre-med student? So I've read. I didn't know that until it was just recently written about in a book. And what was HR like? Did he ever, like, give any homophobia towards you at all? No. Not to me. HR was the energizer. He was really passionate about what he did. He was a visionary. He really got a lot of his kids thinking like we can do anything. He was really full of like great ideas and like was always the one who said go. Like Bad Brains always started their set with are you ready? That was the way and it said they were they were a complete inspiration of a band. So I knew him on that level. When he became a Rasta things became more distant and all this uh, the homophobic stuff all that stuff kind of came up later on and that but at that point I didn't really barely even know him anymore. And now if I see him, like, of course, you know, we would say hi, but we haven't been able to actually have a conversation in, you know, 12 years. Ian, I have some really great practice tapes with about seven minutes of music and about 83 minutes of arguing. Ian Mackay. By which band? I don't know. That was a quote that you said. Oh, yeah. What do you want to know? <laughs> I was curious. What did you mean by that? Well, they're minor thread practice tapes. But we just argued all the time. That band argued. People say, why'd you break up? We said, we were sick of each other. We just argued all the time. We were kids. I mean, Brian was 14 or 15. Lyle was 16. I was 18 or 19. You know, and we were struggling, trying to figure out how to live and how to grow up. You know, and that was a, uh, that band was full of fire. So we have, we had intense arguments. And actually, one of these days I'm going to do... I may well try to do a, a record of just the arguments because they're so classic. Like Thurston Moore did that for Venom, didn't he? Did this Venom oh, stage banter. I never heard that. I'd like to hear that someday. They were arguing, there's a one argument we have about whether, how much you charge for the out of step record. I wanted to charge $3.50. I thought, two fifty for a single, make this a 12 inch, make it three fifty. dollars bam. Be nice, but we ended up having an argument for like half an hour about that. Well, speaking about arguments and stuff, Ian, when was the last time you got in a true blue fist fight? How do you define true blue fist fight? Well, this one, like, real full-on fist fight. This, like, it's like James Dean. I think in 1984 or 1985, I had been in a hospital where I had a shoulder problem that they thought was cancer but it wasn't it was undiagnosed pain and I came out of the hospital I had a biopsy on this shoulder I came out of the hospital and I went to go see the Minutemen play right to spring open for the Minutemen Brendan had been in a car accident and had his arm in a sling so they had to do an acoustic set because he couldn't actually drum he just had to play a standing up snare or percussion type thing and during that Minutemen show a guy punched my brother Alec and I think I hit him with a right, but my arm was so sore. And it just reminded me that it was such an intensely painful experience that it reminded me again that I was done fighting for good. And I did not fight again. I mean, I've had, I've had moments of like altercation, not, not fights like in the sense of like, there was like an argument that went into a fight, more like somebody pushed me or someone, you know, she, you know, did something where I kind of went, you know, pushed him back or something. But I don't fight. I don't, I think it's a, as a, as a form of communication, it's a bankrupt form of communication. There was a rumor in the fancy butterfly juice that you once hit a kid in the head with a hammer. That's not true. That's a, a mutation of a story about when I was in high school, there was a kid named Josh, uh... Josh Freeze at the Vandals. No. Because he's from Los Angeles, I'm from Washington, D.C. Okay, that was just throwing a joke out. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't think of Josh. Josh, I don't know. We were in a theater production together called the Wilson Players. It was like a community theater that actually was in this school. And I was building a flat. You know what a flat is? A house. 
Yeah. Flat a beer. No, flat would be the things that you put up around the stage to kind of backdrop the scenery, the set. So you build a flat, you just take, you build frames, and then you stretch out, you take some fabric and stretch out and you paint the fabric to make it look like the walls. So I was on my hands and knees, I was squatting down, banging, nailing together a flat, a frame for a flat. And a bunch of kids were smoking dope in there, which was pretty normal at that time. It was 1979 or maybe 1980. 79, 78 or 79, I guess. And I was just building this flat. They were all getting high in the corner. And Josh came over and tapped me on the shoulder. And I stood and was like, what's up? And he was about, you know, this far. And he blew pot smoke in my face, which just was insane. So I took a step back and threw the hammer at him. I hit him in the knee. I didn't hit him in the head, though. But it was not in the sense I was trying to break his knee. It was that I was having a reaction to being sort of assaulted. I felt like I had been assaulted. I don't appreciate that. I, I was minding my business. He was a bully. Do you understand that? Yes, I do, Ian. Okay. I wouldn't hit somebody in the head with a hammer. I'm not a malicious person. Ian, winding up here with Ian from the rock and roll band Fugazi in Where Vancouver, British show? Columbia, oh, yeah, Canada. Brit Butter Butterfield, what was it called? Butterfly? Butterfly Juice, Butterfly Juice, juice oh, fanzine. Yeah. When SSD Control came down to New York, they brought a lot of their crew with them, and then there was the New York crew. There was the Boston crew fighting. Who do you think won versus the two crews? You th was I there? I was just curious what your take on that was, like the intense loyalty, you know, the Boston crew versus the New York crew. What is your question? Like, what was the take? What's your take on that? The crews, the two crews fighting. You know, when, like, Boston goes down to New York, and a New York crew is there, and it was like a big slam pit, and some of the kids from Boston had giant X's on their forehead, so they knew who was on their team. Hmm. Where'd you hear that from? What's your source on this stuff? This is a friend of mine named Jonas told me this. Yeah, X's on the forehead. Well, the early punk rock, things were very regional. People came from, there was kids from Philadelphia, kids from Boston, kids from New York, kids from DC, kids from Richmond, kids from Detroit, kids from Atlanta. So you just would run in, but people, because you know they're kids and part of being a punk rocker is being marginalized, feeling marginalized and looking for a family to belong to. Them. And because of the, it was an era where there was so much sort of animosity coming towards kids who were punk rockers, they started to form fairly tight cells, their families. So. When they moved, they went to other places, they would run into other people who were like also in their own kind of families. Um, so I don't know, like I know Boston had a crew of people. I know those kids from New York. I know those kids from Washington. I know there was a lot of, there was a lot of friction, but not everybody from Boston hated everybody from New York and not everybody from Washington hated people from New York. It was sort of like, just, you just knocked heads. As far as like Boston and New York and a slam pit with X's and heads, that sounds like a big cartoon to me. I don't even know what you're talking about, but Sure, there was times where people had disagreements or whatever, but who would have won? Who gives? Who cares? Ian, how come you never got a tattoo? Before you answer that question, you've got two questions left. Thank you. Have you seen The Filth and the Fury? Yes. How would you compare that to Instrument? And you guys played with Pill at one time, and have you met Johnny Rotten? Um, he didn't speak with me, so I didn't meet him, I guess. My thread did open for PIL uh, in uh, October 31st, 1982, Richie Coliseum. They, uh, we came off stage, we played for a pizza and a case of Coca-Cola. That was our payment that night. Um, and I think they came in, when we came off stage, they pulled up in a limousine after us. So it was sort of a two ships passing the night. Uh, and I don't really compare instrument to Filth and the Fury. I didn't, I never bothered comparing it. Did you? No, I was just curious no, if you thought about any comparison between the two. No, I didn't think about it. Thank you very much, Ian Mackay. Really appreciate your time. Keep on rocking in the free world and do 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 loot do Nice to see you again, Notawar. Please, Ian, <laughs> do 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 loot do Take care. That was rhythmic.